Hello beautiful people and welcome to the channel Life After Narc. My name's Debbie and I talk about all things to do with narcissistic, abusive and toxic relationships, as well as looking at healing from them. And in today's video, I'm taking a look at the four stages of narcissistic relationships. Before I begin though, I have really would like you to sign a petition. I'm putting a link to the petition below. You can sign it from anywhere in the world. It will take you less than two minutes. There's no money involved in this at all. It is to do with a building development that they want to put um, on land behind me, which I have no problem with, except for the fact that there's a lot of wildlife there, but they want to knock through my house and garden. So that's where I have a bit of a problem. So if you could please sign this petition to um, help stop this build go ahead and hopefully change it to a different area within the village. Thank you. Before I go into the detail of this video, if you like it, please click the like button. Please subscribe to the channel and share with your friends, family, anyone who you think may benefit. The four stages of a narcissistic relationship. So I have mentioned some of these stages in previous videos, but um, they've been individual videos. So I'm putting all four together here so you can see and you can gauge where you at with it, where you are at within your relationship. Sorry, where I say where you at, it's a South African thing. I spent a lot of time there growing up. So the first phase is the love bombing phase or the idealization phase. This is the beginning and it is amazing. You are swept off your feet. This is the fairy tale coming true. This is exactly what you always wanted, but it's not. The narcissist is mirroring you. They found a good source of supply in you, whether it was money, a home, sex, your looks, your friends, food, clothing, what a car, whatever it was, they found a good source of, of supply and they are going to stick with you until they have drained all of that supply. They will put you up on a pedestal and worship you. Flowers, chocolates, um, dates, expensive meals, if they can afford it. Um, you know, all these wonderful special things that happen. You think, what, this is the person I've been looking for all my life. Well, no, it's not because things are about to go south. And there may be a few arguments at the beginning, a few small, smallish arguments. And you think, oh, I'm not I'm not putting up with this. And you ask them to leave and they do leave. And then they come crawling back and you forgive them and you take them back. And that's part really of the relationship. But is it if you have a difficult argument with somebody and you see a side of them that you don't like, should you really be with them? They'll tell you they love you very early on in the relationship and this backs up your feelings for them. They may even propose to you early on. Mine did. Mine proposed very early on in the relationship. Um, and it was sweet the way he proposed. And I said yes, because I thought that he loved me and I thought that this was the person I was going to be with. Little did I know, of course, that the kind of person that he was. It all seems too good to be true. And you know what? It is too good to be true. The second phase is the devaluation phase. And this is where they begin to pull away from you. But at the same time, they are hurting you. Little digs here and there at your personality, at what you do, at perhaps your job, perhaps your looks. They may say things to you such as, well, I don't like your hair that colour, but I liked your hair this colour. Or won't you wear this outfit for me? Or... Um, and these all sound like very normal things, don't they, that somebody would say in a relationship. But really, would would you like to be told that, you know, um, wear this dress rather than that dress because you look better in it? Well, hang on a second. What? I like this dress. I'm going to wear this dress. They may ignore you at times. And that could be seemingly innocuous, that, but... Maybe they're sat there on their phone or watching TV or doing one of their hobbies and you ask them a question and they just ignore you. They may start ridiculing you or telling you they don't like the way you wear your hair, which I've already said. 
And they may start belittling you. My, my next started belittling me. He wrote a song for me called I Know a Girl Who's a Pain in the Bomb. And he sang this to me nearly every single day of our relationship. What does that start to do to you? It devalues you. It makes you think you are actually a pain in the bomb. It makes you think that, well, I'm not good enough. No matter what I do, I'm not good enough. No matter if I do everything, absolutely everything that they want me to do, I'm never good enough. They'll begin to do things without including you or saying things to you such as, um, oh, I'm going to go to this party, but you're not coming with me. Hang on, you're going to a party without me? I would never go to a party without you unless it was a hen party, which obviously is something completely different. Um, so they'll start to do these things without including you. And... Mine had a thing that on Sundays the family would get together and I wanted to do some things on a, on a Sunday which were different. So I would spend the time alone on my own. I did go through quite a few times and I did enjoy being with the family. But to me, not every Sunday should be spent doing that. I feel that if you're in a relationship with somebody and you're married and we were married, that you should create your own rituals, your own specific days. Um, perhaps they begin to watch porn or to masturbate. And I will never forget the first time I caught him doing that. He was embarrassed and had a cheeky grin on his face and asked me if I wanted to join him. Honestly, guys, I can't remember if I did or didn't. It's irrelevant. But he was a porn addict and a sex addict. And a lot of times you will find that they are. And if they don't get it from you, they're getting it somewhere else. They may start to argue with you over small things, over tiny things, over little tiny things. And mine did. Mine um devalued me in so many ways he, and he would have temper tantrums dreadful temper tantrums stomping his feet stomping upstairs throwing things against walls um it was just it was scary and i would tiptoe if i felt that he was in this dark mood i wouldn't speak to him i would tiptoe past him get myself a cup of tea tiptoe past him again and go up to my room because i knew that if I started any conversation with him at that stage, things would get out of control. Whereas with me, when I needed space, I didn't get that space. He wanted to force the conversation. And again, that's something else that the narcissist will do. They will try and pick at you and pick at you and pick at you until you explode, until you go reactive on them. And it's called reactive abuse. And I'll put a link to that video in the description box below. And then they turn around, see, see, that's what you do. Whenever we do this, that's what you do. Meanwhile, they've deliberately, deliberately done this to you. And then we come to the discard phase. So your partner, your next is devaluing you constantly and you feel worthless. You feel hopeless. You're lost. You're alone. You've got nobody to turn to. All you know is that you want to fix this relationship and you want it to be like it was before, like it was at the beginning in the love bombing phase. And you know they can be, but they don't like it. They save that for the next one that comes along. But then they'll apologise and say, I won't do it again. And so the cycle continues. But during the discard, they become nasty. They become very mean. They become horrible. They change. They're no longer the person that you knew. At the time of my discard, I was looking after my father, who was terminally ill, um, quite away from home. And so I would spend days there and come back for a couple of days and go back and spend maybe a week with my family. And believe me, it was necessary. If any of you have ever looked after somebody who is dying, you know what it's like. You know 
how heartbreaking it is, the emotion that goes on, the the time that you spend. And I was not sleeping. I had no space of my own. And after my father had passed and after the funeral had happened, I asked my narcissistic ex to please give me some space so that I can recuperate and recover from this because I knew that as soon as I got home, he would start on me and he would pick on me and I would have to pick up. I would have no respite. I would have no time to recover from my grief that I was feeling. And he said this was too difficult for him to do. This was, this was you know, inconvenient for other people. Well, yeah, the last six months of my life were inconvenient to me. But you know what? I did it because I loved my father. I still do. I talk to him every day. And if you love somebody and they ask a favour of you like that, you do it. You say, okay, I understand. But I wouldn't have been like that if it was the other way around. I would have given him the space that he needed to heal, to grieve, and not approached him and, and want to argue with him or fight with him. Also, the discard, they may become more physically abusive, more sexually abusive, um, definitely more verbally abusive towards you, telling you that you're useless, you're a waste of space. They will degrade you. Your self-confidence will go. Your self-worth will go. You will feel just worthless. It's a horrible, horrible feeling. And then one day you come home from work or home from being away at your parents again or you wake up in the morning and they've gone. No word, no letter, no phone call. They've just vanished. Poof, thin air. And that leaves you lost, completely, totally and utterly lost. You don't know. You don't know where you stand anymore. You phone them and ask them, what's going on? Why did this happen? Why, why did you leave? And they give you all of these reasons and excuses and, and they take things as well. They, they take things that, that don't belong to them. They don't, you know, if a normal relationship is going to end, the two parties sit down together and say, you know, this relationship isn't working anymore. I'm not happy. We need to go our separate ways. And it's done amicably and with love and respect and kindness. But just walking out on a person is disrespectful. It's unkind. It's unfair. It's nasty. Especially when they take some of your things. They've left because you have nothing more to give them. Either they have found new supply or they have new supply lined up. So what that means is that they found somebody else to be with, the person, perhaps, perhaps they were already having an affair. But they found somebody that they want to be with. And this is like, right, I'm going to get this person. I know that this person likes me. Or, as I say, they have got this person lined up already and they're already seeing them. And it breaks you. This discard, the way they discard you, breaks you in so many ways. So, so many ways. But I promise you now, you can get through it. Now, the next stage of the relationship is the hoover. And this is when the narcissist will try to get you back. Perhaps their new supply hasn't worked out quite the way they hoped. Perhaps they... Uh, this new supply wasn't what they expected. Perhaps they couldn't find a place to live. Um, you know, perhaps they lost their job or their car. Something happened and they have nowhere to go. So they contact you because they know that you'll probably say, yeah, OK, come back. Don't do it. You already know that they will go on to devalue you once again and to discard you once they have found new supply. Mine tried to contact me through a family member, sent them a, um, a message through Messenger and wanted to know how I was doing and, you know, do they think that I would speak to him? And I'd already told this person, I don't want to know. I don't want anything to do with him. And um, this person told him that. And so that was it. I was lucky, I guess that I'd already put the no contact in place. 
I'd already said I don't want to speak to him ever again. The things he said to me when he left were hurtful and horrible. And I'll put a link to the grand finale below, which is my most watched video on YouTube. It's had over 2000 views now. And um, it tells the story of what happened when he left me. It's really good. It is. It's really. And it's the truth as well. And I will testify to that in court on a Bible, even though I don't believe in God. I will testify to the goddess that that is the truth. The only reason, as I say, they want you back is for supply because they've lost their supply. Whomever it was, whomever it was that they had lined up has gone from their life. And if you take them back, like I say, the whole process starts again. You've already started your healing journey. It's time to carry on. They don't love you. They never have and they never will. Carry on growing. Carry on being yourself. Carry on healing yourself. And I'm going to put a couple of links to some videos that I've done about healing from narcissistic relationships. And I just want to say that I'm now 15, nearly 16 months on from that relationship. And every day I wake up with a smile on my face because I know that I don't have to put up with that S-H-I-T anymore. So if you've enjoyed the video, please click the like button. Please subscribe to the channel and share with your friends and family. Also, please sign the um, petition that I've linked below. It would be a massive help for me and everybody who lives within this area. Hope to see you next time. Blessed be.